issues. <laughs> Zero apologies. Uh, we're still, you'd imagine, be used to these webinars by now. Um, so, as I was saying, so the um, yeah, the other webinars in the series, uh, we've covered that. And and look, the the aim of the QS series, um, you know, I look at it as this is information that I would have, I would like to have known when I was practicing as a QS. And I look, and and look, I hope to, that you know you can understand, you know, what how you know how the system operates. Um, and the, the reason for that is that you can deal with this, uh, you know, when you come across it in practice. This, you know, I mean, it's something that I've developed during my time as a as a trainee solicitor. And and yeah, I, I think if you can get a good grasp on this stuff, it'll really help you to be more, you know, more efficient and more effective, and be more and be more confident in what you do as well. So uh, please bear that in mind. Okay, so. Um, so yeah, so just some terms. So tonight you're going to look, so obviously we're talking about payments. So, you know, some of the terms that we're looking at here, if I say the payer, that means the party making the payment. So for example, if you have a, a relationship between a um, main contractor and an employer, then the payer is, is the employer in that relationship. Um, similarly, if it, you know the unpaid party, um, is, we refer to that as the payee. So the, so, you know, again, an employer main contractor relationship, the unpaid party is the main contractor. So that's just, uh, you know, giving you the basics there. Right. So moving on to the legislation. So here you can see the, you know, the main, the main uh, legislation that we have is the, the Housing Grants Construction and Regeneration Act. Uh, we refer to that as the, as, the, as the Act or the Construction Act as it's known. Um, now, this, this act came into effect on the 1st of May 1998. Uh, you'll see there that I've included um, a photograph of Michael Jordan and Phil Jackson. Um, I've been watching the, uh, the Last Dance on Netflix lately. Uh, I enjoyed it. So I, I just think it gives a good indication of just how long uh, the act has been in operation and obviously still very much relevant to, to pretty much everything that we do in relation to payment and construction. Now there's many sections, but you know tonight we're going to focus on the uh, the, the ones highlighted in bold. So that's sections 109 to 111. Uh, we'll also look at you know conditional payments then, and uh, uh, you know the and and pay when paid. So yeah, so we will move on. Um, we're also going to look at the scheme. So the scheme basically fleshes out the. Uh, payment mechanism uh, that's referred to in the Construction Act. Again, that was brought in at the same time as the as the Construction Act, and it has two parts. Part one relates to adjudication, uh, which we're going to deal with next month, and part two relates to payments. Now, one thing to bear in mind is that unlike adjudication, not all of the scheme is implied um, in relation to payments. Uh, all of the scheme comes in for adjudication, but bear in mind that that is not the case for uh, for payments. And also, we're going to look at the Local Democracy, Economic Development, and uh, and Construction Act 2009, or El Dead Cares, are referred to it. Um, so this came into effect on the 1st of October 2011. Now there you can see a picture of Rory McElroy from the US uh, Open back then. So again, it just gives it just helpful for me just to. Uh, you know, every, I love sports, so everything that I, you know, I want to tie it back to, it just gives you an idea for how long these, uh, you know, this legislation is actually in existence. Um, so the key amendments, I mean, it, meant, it amended um, a significant uh, parts of the Construction Act, um, especially in Section 110, and, and, you know, brought in such definitions as payee, payer, payment due date, and a specified person. And section 111 then it distinguished that PLS notice from a withholding notice, which is a withholding notice, notice was in place before El, um, El Dedca came into effect. And just bear in mind as well that when I talk about the Act, I talk about the Act as amended under El Dedca as well, uh, just so we don't have to keep jump, uh, uh, you know, splitting, the, splitting the different uh, areas of legislation. Oh, okay, so moving on. So, you know, the interpretation of the payment dates. So the key here is that we're reading the Act and the scheme together, um, which we'll see, is, you know, is, is absolutely how, we, how it must be done. So Section 109 of the, you know, of the, of the Act, so this relates to entitlement to stage payments. 
and it said that every construction contract must give a party the right to be paid by installments, stage payments or other periodic payments if the project is longer than 45 days. It says that the parties are free to agree payment amounts, intervals and circumstances when payment becomes due. So that just says, you know, the parties are obviously, they're, they're better to make their own agreements, but, um, you know, it goes on further to say, in the absence of such agreement, the scheme applies. Because the, the historic problem was that parties would agree a construction contract, but very often the payment mechanism was, was inadequate. And that led to a whole host of queries in relation to, um, uh, you know what? You know what is the proper payment procedure? Um, when am I going to get my payment? Um, and so, therefore, you know, Parliament dealt with um, you know dealt with such issues, which happened very frequently. Um, you know, when they brought in the you know the act and the scheme. So entitlement to amount of stage payments. So we're in the scheme in part two. So where the parties have failed to agree the amount of an installment or the payment intervals, then paragraphs two to four of the scheme will apply. Uh, the extent of what is implied by the court depends on the extent of the non-compliance. So again, remember that not all of the scheme is, is, is brought in um, should there, you know, should one you know one part of the payment mechanism be inadequate then the scheme can deal with that but it is not introduced wholly um like you know as it, like i said earlier as we do for adjudication um, and this is why it's very important thing to remember the, uh, so it's the extent of what is implied by the courts um, you know if you don't have an adequate payment mechanism uh, this was dealt with in the in the case of grow developments versus balfour beauty back in 2016 um, so what it did was it, it, so basically, as you can see in the picture there, um, Balfour Beauty were building a, a hotel for Grove Developments over beside the O2. Now, what happened was, is that the, the, the parties had agreed a payment schedule in their contract, but what they forgot to do, well, I suppose what they didn't do was agree like a runoff period for payments in the event that, in the event that the project went beyond the, the overall completion date. And when it did that, um, so it, the last payment was to be made in July, I think, you know, 2015. And obviously the project went beyond July. So when it got to August 20, 2016 then, or 2015, the there was no there was no payment uh, procedure um, in the contract so then the question um, the question arose you know what what happens now and basically the case and and in that case Coulson confirmed that uh, it this, the whole of the scheme is not implied and he he said that to um, you know to imply the scheme here would be to rectify a bad bargain you know so what he's saying is that um, uh, Balfour Beatty should have included a runoff period in their payment schedule uh, if they if that's what they if they intended to get paid for uh, you know for the payments beyond uh, the overall completion date. Now the so the finding in the court and the court of appeal agreed with Coulson and what they said what was that there is no express or implied term um, allowing a party to to continued payments. Uh, it also said that the contract complied with section 109 and there was no need to imply any further elements of the scheme. So he said there was no fresh contract for payments after the payment schedule expired. And accordingly, they found that the next time that a payment was due to Balfour Beatty under the contract was under the final account mechanism that was agreed separately in the contract. So you can see, you know, you, you can see why we have to be careful, um, you know, with what the scheme is actually intends to do. And here it's clear in, in the case of Grove versus Balfour Beatty, that one thing is not, it is not intended to do is to rectify what, what, what we know as a bad bargain. Um, it confirms the court, the English court's non-interventionist -interve approach to such circumstances. So please be very careful and don't assume that just because, um, you know, that the payment schedule has expired, that you will be entitled to further payment. Um, in line with Grove and Balfour Beatty, that wasn't the case. And the next time they were entitled to payment was accordingly when the final account, uh, you know, when the, when the project was complete effectively. 
Okay, so moving on. So we go to section 10 of the Act and we're looking at the, uh, the dates for payments. Now, what it says is that every construction contract must provide an adequate mechanism for determining what payments become due and when they become due, along with a final date for payment. So, the, so whether an adequate mechanism has been provided or not is a question of fact. So that's basically, it comes down to the specifics as to what's been agreed between the party. Um, and where it is unclear, um, either what payments become due or when they become due, then that's where the scheme comes in to rectify uh, the position and basically make good on the payment, may convert it into an adequate mechanism so the parties understand when those payments become due. Uh, so the due date comes in under the scheme, under paragraph four of the scheme. And what that says is if the construction contract does not include a due date, then the payment becomes due seven days after the date of the valuation or the payee making a claim, whichever, whichever is the later. So that is the, um, so that's the, you know, seven days after the date of the valuation, that's under the scheme, that's what the due date becomes. Uh, then the final date for payment is dealt with in, the, in paragraph eight of the scheme. Uh, so where the construction contract fails to provide a final date for payment, then the scheme is imported and the final date for payment shall be 17 days from the date that payment becomes due. Uh, so this effectively acts as a long stop date from the pay, for the payment and the parties are free to agree the length of time between the due date and the final date. So if you have, I mean, for example, if you have a contract, if you have a contract, but you, you haven't confirmed a due date, but you have a final date for payment agreed between the parties, then, you know, scheme paragraph four makes good on that. And then what, you know, and then the final date for payment will become, however, the number of days following the due date as, as agreed between the parties and where they haven't agreed it, then simply the scheme will, will, um, will be brought in and the payment will become, the final date for payment will be 17 days after the due date. So section 110 continued, and this was an area that was significantly amended under the, um, under, un, under El Dedka. Now what, what I said was um, section 110, 1A, so parties cannot include pay when certified clauses because an adequate mechanism cannot link to payment obligations under another contract. Now do be aware that, these, that this is similar to, this is different to section 113. Um, which relates to conditional payments and what we know class, as the classic pay when paid clauses. Um, so section 110, uh, 1B uh, deals, so upstream insolvencies are expected from the, pro, are exempted from the prohibition on conditional payment clauses in construction contracts. Section 110, 1C, pay when certified per, is permitted in management contracting between the employer and the management contractor. Now that's an interesting one because if you have a management contract, then the management the management contractor is is required to pay pay his subcontractors where he has received in fact in received payment from his employer. So that's one important quirk to it to to keep in the back of your mind if you're dealing with management a uh, management contract. And finally, section 110.1d, uh, the due date cannot depend on the payer issuing a notice to the payee. So that effectively means that, um, you know, the due date applies and, and is never, you know, should never be conditional on the payer issuing a, a notice because, you know, as, you know, as would happen, as frequently would happen, is that the payer would not issue a notice and then the payee doesn't become entitled to payment and that just wouldn't be right. So that's dealt with in section 110.1d. Uh, Okay, moving on. So payment notices. So the contractual requirements. Um, so the construction contract shall require the payer or a specified person to issue the payment note, a payment notice not later than five days after the payment due date. So the payment, the payment notice is compliant if it states the sum, the, the sum the payer considers to be due and the basis of calculation. So again, just very important uh, two points there that you know, part of the legislation, uh, those two requirements, if you, when you are uh, providing a payment notice is to, um, you know, confirm the sum you believe to be due and provide a base of calculation. And the final point here is that even if the sum is zero, um, a payment notice is still required and that's confirmed under section 110A uh, part four. 
So section 110B, so default, this is a default payment notice. Now, a default payment notice is different to your standard pay, uh, payment notice. Um, so it applies where the, fair pay, sorry, where the payer fails to issue a payment notice. Uh, this allows the payee to issue its own payment notice after the payer has failed to issue in line with the contract. If the payee is late issuing the, the default payment notice, then the final date for payment is postponed for the same number of days as, as the payee was late in issuing the, the default payment notice. Uh, the requirement for a default payment notice must be stated in the contract, uh, which, is, which happens very, very rarely now, really, is that, um, you know, that a default payment notice is required in the event that um, the payee is late. Or sorry, where the yeah the pay the sorry the payer has failed to issue its 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 notice, um because what you know what happens is either now you issue a notice of um intention to suspend or you basically run a smash and grab adjudication. So you know default payment notices very it's an area that's frequently um misunderstood, but it's it you know it's very rare that that they happen in um, in practice uh, uh, these days. So now we move on to section 111. So this is the requirement to pay the notified sum. So the payer is required to pay the notified sum by the final date for payment. Uh, so then we're looking at, you know, what is the what is the notified sum? And this was addressed in the case of Severfield versus Juro Felguera UK. Um, and in that case, Coulson took a very simplified approach as to what the notified sum is. And he, and he said that the notified sum is the, note, is the net total claimed by the payee. And it is not the individual components of that sum. So what he's looking at is he's saying, regardless of the detail, he's saying that the notified sum, so there's no confusion around what that is, is it simply is the, the net total that's being claimed by the payee. So if you are dealing with section one, uh, section one eleven, then then do do bear that in mind. Uh, section one eleven also deals with pay less notices. Uh, section one eleven part three really. Uh, so the payer must issue a pay less notice to the payee, which is a notice of the payer's intention to pay less than the notified sum, on or before the final date for payment. Now again, just bear in mind with pay less notices, they're different to your payment notice, they're different to your, pay, uh, to your default payment notice as well. Um, so, you know, the, where there's an intention to pay less. So, I mean, to be fair, like pay, pay less notices are, you know, ver, you know they're, they're by far the most common form of notice uh, given by, you know, given by the payer to the payee because, you know, it's very rare that in fact that uh, you know that the payer would agree with absolutely everything uh, that the payee has claimed for in his application for payment. Again, the wording is you know the wording is straightforward. Uh, the pay less notice must specify the sum that this, that the payer considers to be due and also provide a base of calculation. You know similar requirements uh, which we'll see in in the case of uh, Grow versus S and T later. Um, Again, where the sum is zero, you still got to issue your PLS notice. Um, because if you don't, again, if you don't, if you don't do that, then you're gonna, uh, you're gonna have, a, you're gonna have an adjudication on your hands. So yeah, even if the sum is zero, you still got to, pay, you still got to issue the PLS notice. Um, so we're just going to summarize at this point. Um, I've just put brought in these tables just to give you um, an example. So as to how a payment, uh, you know, payment schedule. Uh, would look, you know, just taking the example here of the JCT Design and Build Contract 2016. So if we're saying that the application date, uh, it just say is today, the 28th of May, then, on, you know, the due date under the JCT Design and Build Contract is the application date plus seven days. Then you go to your payment notice date and the, the payment notice date is the due date plus five days. Uh, pay less notice date, is the final date for payment minus seven. Because if you go to the final date for payment, that, be, that kicks in 14 days after the due date. So that just, I mean, it's a good exercise actually just to test your knowledge in this area um, to see, you know, exactly, you know, under, understand these dates because it's very important, obviously, you know, as to when you're obviously making your application dates, but you know, for the um, 
especially for the for the payer that he understands you know when he's got to give his payment notice um, and and also his pay less notice because obviously you know serious ramifications if he's late with either of those days um, so you know, so we move down to the set, to the to the to the next section, and under the scheme, you can see it's um, it's very similar. Um, so the due date is you know seven days after the application date. Payment notice uh, is is due um, is five days after the due date. The pay less notice must be issued seven days before the final date for payment, and the final date for payment is calculated as seventeen days after the due date. So. I mean, just to test your, I mean, to test your knowledge, you know, even when I was in practice, I, I, I used to just pull out the contract and work out these dates for myself, um, just to confirm the understanding as to what the actual dates are and, you know, who's got to do what and when. It's very, you know, very, very good to understand. Um, and if you do run the exercises, then just, you, you know, just check, check back and just confirm that, you know, they are understood and, and that we do know when, you know, when we're required to carry out our actions and also when we're obviously supposed to get, you know, if in the case where we're a payee, that we know when, we're, when, payment, is, when payment has to be made. Okay, so we're going to leave the you know the payment dates, and we're going to look at the requirements for valid payment and pay less notices. And there's much case law in this area, uh, you know, which which basically you know which culminated in the you know in the case of of Grow versus S and T. Now the re so the Grow versus versus S and T in that case, you know, Coulson did rely on a lot of you know historical. Um, case law, which which really assisted him um, to you know provide a, a definitive a definitive position as to what the requirements of a valid payment notice or pay less notice are, and he went you know, so he started out uh, with the case of many investment versus Eagle Star. Now, in that case, it was said that notices must be approached objectively. And, it re and with reference to how the reasonable re recipient would have understood the notice. Um, and it, also that it must take into account the relevant objective contextual scene. So you can see the, you know, the emphasis there on the, you know, the requirement to be objective and also the reference to the reasonable recipient, which are two, two very important uh, points that Coulson dealt with um, in Grove versus s and so then also he referred to the case of Thomas Vale construction versus Brookside Sistan. And in that case, it was, it was said that um, it is inappropriate to apply a fine contextual analysis to a notice where it was issued simply to say a payment was not being made due to outstanding defects and incomplete works. Now, you might come across this is, a, is that the you know, and where you might get an email, and and I've seen this happen before, that you know, basically in response to a um, an application for payment, so the so the payer might send an email saying that, well, you you haven't you haven't uh, made good any outstanding defects, and also, you know, some there are incomplete works, so therefore you're not entitled to be paid, um. You know what we're seeing here is that I mean that that's not that that won't be that won't stack up as a valid uh, payless notice um, in any event. Um, so that's what he's saying. If you simply say a payment was not being made for those grounds, it's ineffective as a payment or payless notice. Uh, moving on to the case of wind glass windows versus skyline construction. Uh, this is in 2009 and confirmed that the courts take a practical view of the contents of. A, you know, of an app of a of a payment or payless notice, and will not entertain arguments that the notice is artificial or contrived. So again, you can see this happens uh, frequently. Where you know, I mean, there would be no, there's no, there's no entitlement for the payer to deduct money, say for non not providing collateral warranties, say that are required under the contract. I've seen this come across this a few times. Um, so where you would say that, uh, yeah, he provide a valuation of the works, but you just say that the the payment came to a hundred thousand pounds, 
um, then what you see, what, what I've seen in the past is that he, there's um, a further deduction uh, to that sum of £100,000 for failure to um, to provide the collateral warranties. So that's what the courts are saying is that, you know, they're going to take a practical view to the contents and not entertain these arguments that the notice is artificial or contrived. If you want to deduct money as a result of non-provision of collateral warranties, then the contract needs to say so. Uh, so do bear that in mind. Um, also, the case of Henya Investments versus Beck Interiors back in 2015, uh, in that case, it was said that one way of testing the pay less notice was to see whether it provided an adequate agenda for an adjudication as to the true value of the works and the validity of the alleged entitlement to liquidated damages for a delay. Now, a key point here is the provision of an adequate agenda. So, you know, if, if I receive a pay less notice, you know, do I understand um, you know, the reasons why the deductions are being made. And uh, on that basis, uh, you know, if I was dissatisfied with how it's been valued, you know, would I, would I in fact have a, an adequate agenda to, um, you know, to be able to review this and, you know, a, the true value of the works um, in an adjudication. So again, just, you know, just um, stand back and just ask yourself that question. It, is it sufficient to meet to meet the, that requirement, um, which was again referred to by Coulson um, in Grove versus S and T, which we now come on to, which is basically the is is the you know is the current law on, on this point and and you know very you know very important decision and Coulson uh, just Coulson um, in that case uh, so he considered previous authorities uh, and he dismissed S and T's arguments that gross pay less notice had failed to specify the amount due. Uh, it was said that the question of whether a pay less notice is compliant is a matter of fact and degree. He also clarified that though there had been a hint in previous authorities that an employer's pay less notice might be construed more generously than a contractor's interim application, uh, there should not be a difference in approach. Arguments for s and were dismissed that posed hypothetical situations that might arise from a finding that a pay less notice could be compliant where a breakdown was not attached. The judge dismissed these fanciful, factful scenarios in concluding that on the facts of this case, the reasonable recipient would have known precisely what sum was being deducted and the basis of its calculation. So the reason, so how we came to that was, um, SNT, SNT issued a, an, an application for payment. Grove responded uh, with their pay less notice. But in, in that, say, in, the, in that email, it didn't attach to, uh, one, say, a, a spreadsheet that uh, was, was referred to in the, in the actual pay less notice itself. But it had been sent to SNT previously. So SNT, you know, you're, you know, we're trying to uh, find find a pay less notice invalid on a very kind of narrow and uh, strict interpretation that the basis of calculation had not been complied with. But what Coulson said was that, look, you, you had the breakdown. It had been submitted previously. It hadn't been changed in the um, in the pay less notice. And so what he's saying is that the, re the reasonable recipient would have known the sum being deducted and the base of his calculation, because the reasonable recipient being, a, you know, a QS that's receiving uh, this pay less notice, it's reasonable for him to, re you know, review the pay less notice. If he does, if he's missing a breakdown, but he has received it previously, then it's reasonable for him to go back and use that as a reason to understand the basis of calculation in the pay less notice. Um, you know, and, and so, you know, dismiss s and um, application and basically keyword, you know, keywords there was that, you know, the, is, you know, is it compliant relate, you know, comes down to, a, you know, a matter of fact and degree. Um, you know, there's, so that that's basically it, you know, would the reasonable recipient know what, you know, precisely the sum being deducted and the base of calculation. Uh, if you can satisfy those requirements, then, you know, the, the pay less notice will be, will be valid and basically the courts will not be you know keen to open up 
you know, for, you know, or, or be, or to review payment or, you know, pay less notices on a very, you know, on a very narrow kind of interpretation and almost like a technicality. Uh, the courts aren't, you know, aren't up for that. And, um, and Coulson has, has now dealt with it um, in, in this case. So, so yeah, so all, always when you do receive um, a PLS notice, you know, just, and you may not have a, a all, you know, all of the breakdowns, but do check, you, you know, you are required to check in fact that, you know, have those breakdowns be, be provided to you previously. And if they have, and the sums in the PLS notice haven't changed, then, um, you know, it's reasonable that you're, that you're required to, to, you know, to, to do your, do your own analysis and, and make sure that you understand, um, you know, what the basis of calculation is and the onus is on, you know, on the receiver uh, to carry out that, that, that action. So look, very important. Um, really, you know, crystallizes the point here. Um, and also one, one other point to bear in mind is that in Grove versus s and uh, Coulson, you know, he, he, he treated uh, PLS notices he, uh, and PLS and payment notices as the same. And, and he said that the requirements are the same. Um, and there's no, no need to differentiate. But obviously it's going to apply more in a PLS notice because a PLS notice is, isn't, you know, is, is, is what the, you know, the payer is telling the payee, you know, he's paying him less than he's applied for. And obviously it's going to come under scrutiny, more scrutiny than a payment notice where, you know, where the payer is basically saying, yeah, I agree to everything that you've applied for and I'm going to certify the full amount. Um, so yeah, so just a, you know, a final point to bear in mind there. Uh, on the on the facts in 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 this case, um, okay. So we're going to move on now. We're we're jumping back. That was like a you know that was like a whistle stop tour on the you know on the analysis of payment you know pay, payment notices and PLS notices and the, and the case how that relates. So you know I hope you found that helpful because you know very common area um, you know that we see you know being part of disputes. And, you know, obviously what, you know, what we're trying to, you know, we're trying to do here is that, you know, you can understand this for, you can understand the approach for yourself and therefore, um, you know, be able to, you know, ensure that you provide, you're providing the adequate notices and also that you understand what the, you know, what will happen if in fact that the, you know, the payment or pay list notices are found to be invalid. So, um, so yeah, so we're so on that note, we're going to jump back to the, you know, we're back to the to the Construction Act, and we're looking at Section One Twelve, and um, and so Section One Twelve, you know, provided the um, uh, the statutory right for a con say for a contractor to suspend. So what it says is that the payee has a right to suspend any or all of its obligations under the contract by issuing a seven day notice of its intention to suspend uh, performance. So that's you know very important that you, that you bear that in mind. Um, is that just because you haven't been paid by the final date for payment, doesn't give you an automatic right uh, to suspend. You you must issue the seven day notice. Um, you know because otherwise you could you could be in effect you, you could be in breach of contract, uh, which obviously you, you you want you you want to avoid. So be aware. You know the the notice in in this area section one twelve. And do and make sure, like I you know encourage to get that in, um, as soon as a payment has not been made, um, the right to suspension continues um, until payment has been made in full. So again, so just bear that in mind. You know you're not obliged to accept part payment, uh, you know from the payer, and uh, you are entitled to suspend uh, continuously until the payment has been made in full. Um, the payee's reasonable cost of suspension shall be reimbursed uh, to the payee. So, you know, basically, if you have uh, demobilization costs, um, as you know, due to the due to the you know, the non-payment, then you're entitled to be reimbursed for those. Similarly, where you have to remobilize, um, uh, you're entitled to be you know to be um, <coughs> to be reimbursed for those also. I mean, that will follow on, and you know, in, in in subsequent payments, well, you know, once the once once the outstanding payment um, has been made in full, and that's quite useful to know, just to you know, just to have that peace of mind, because you know sometimes those costs can be substantial, uh, but also bear in mind the need to be reasonable with them, and you won't be entitled to you know to absolutely everything that you know happens as a, as a consequence uh, of the suspension. 
And finally here is that no liquidated damages shall be levied for the period of suspension. So again, if you, you know, if you, if you suspend for a week and you, and you subsequently end up, um, you know, being late uh, on the project for a week, then, you know, you, you, you should not be, you should not have um, liquidated damages deducted against you and you should be effectively entitled to um, an extension of time for, you know, for that period. So do bear those rights in mind when you are issuing a section 112 uh, notice and, and, you know, it's very, it's, it's a good thing, you know, it's, it, it happens very often is that, you know, the, you know, payments are missed. Um, and it's always good to have a section 112 notice, you know, to hand in, you know, in a templates file, you know, that you can, that you can, that you can issue, uh, you know, once, you know, once uh, the, once the payment has, you know, hasn't been made, it just reminds the payer of their obligations and also puts them on notice that if it's not sorted within the seven days, um, well, then you are going to suspend. So, yeah, it's a very useful tool. And it's, I think one that, you know, QS should be, you know, very aware of, uh, just as your right says, you know, what to do in these circumstances. Okay, so moving on. So um, we're looking at the prohibition of, continue, of conditional payments. Uh, this is, again, Section 113 of the Construction Act. Now, if a construction contract contains a paid, pay when paid clause, uh, that clause would be ineffective. Um, but very important point is to note this ex exception. And that exception is that if the third party who is making the payment becomes insolvent, uh, which we refer to as an upstream insolvency. So um, difficult position because um, if, for example, if you are a subcontractor in contract with a main contractor and the main contractor is in, is in contract with the employer. If the, I mean, if the, um, if the employer becomes insolvent, then the, that's, that will kick in to deny the subcontractor payment um, for basically for elements which the main contractor will not have been paid for. So it's a very important, I mean, and, and one thing I, you know, I remind subcontractors of when they're doing their uh, due diligence on projects and reviewing contracts is to, uh, you know, to, to do a check, not only on obviously the main contractor who they're getting into contract with, but also to do a check on the employer, because if the employer is, you know, for example, an SPV, um, SPVs are very, you know, are, you know, very common vehicle for developments. But um, if they are the employer, then you know there is there is a chance that those, you know, that if they become insolvent, then you will lose out in your right to be, you know, to be paid. Um, as a result, so I think you know, as part of a very of a of an effective um, uh, contract review process, then you know, it's 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 a it's good due diligence to also. Uh, be checking out, you know, the, the solvency of the employer. Uh, you know, that means that, that will avoid you getting caught under Section 113, um, you know, where, you know, it's largely assumed that pay when pay clause, you know, are outlawed, but there is this exception. Um, so please be aware of it. And, and as I said, very good practice if you can get into the habit of, uh, of checking out the solvency of the, of the employer also. Okay, so yeah, so look, we're on that on that note, we're we're going to conclude. And um, so we've obviously looked at you know the uh, the legislation. So we looked at the Construction Act, the scheme, and and El Dedka. Uh, you know, we've looked at you know the payment dates that apply. So you know your due date, your final date for payment, uh, your date when you have to issue your payment and pay a less notice. Then we also looked at the case law surrounding a valid payment and pay a less notice. Uh, before moving on to uh, the, you know, we obviously we've just covered uh, the pay pay when paid clause, um, and also just know be aware of your right to suspend as well. So yeah, so that's pretty much like a whistle stop tour of the of the payment legislation and case law. You know that I think you should be aware of that will that will be of uh, real assistance to you in practice, and uh, yeah, and 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 help you to be more more efficient in. Uh, in your in your deal in, in when you're dealing with payments so i'm going to conclude there and uh, yeah i'm happy to take any questions now that you may have okay thanks everyone okay thanks for that Connor. we have indeed had some questions in um 
First one asks, Connor, if you do not agree with the subcontractor's sub monthly valuation and feel that they are over claiming on their works, are you able to notify the subcontractor via the payment notice procedure or do you still need to issue a pay less notice? Um, very good question. Um, I mean, what you can do is you can you can issue a, um, a payment notice a if you if you wish because uh, you know as you know as I was saying earlier is that there you know, there are two separate notices is that you can value the you know you can value the the works and you can issue a subsequent um, pay less notice. I mean, the, the the key point here is that you do need to issue the pay less notice if you are intending to pay less than the sum that the subcontractor has claimed for. So yeah, so all, I mean, if you if you are paying less, do, you know, do always assume that you have to issue a pay less notice. Okay. Um, next question. Yeah. When calculating the various dates, would it be correct to say that non-business days, such as bank holidays, are discounted? Yeah. So the um, so the the days of reckoning are. Di so we deal with um, bank holidays. They're they're uh, referred to as reckoning days. Um, now, those days. If I mean, like, I'm just thinking of the the JCT example, and it does vary in different contracts. But uh, in non-business days, um, I believe are discounted. But I I will check that, Julie. I mean, it's a it's a it's a good question. Um, yeah, obviously, it's very important if you do have bank holidays and you, and it's alleged that you have fail, it failed to issue the pay less notice dates. I mean, my my advice would be to you know assume that the bank holidays count because you don't you know we don't want to get caught. But I can check that. I think that's Paul Short that's asked yeah. that question. Um, so I can I can check that out for you know for for Paul and uh, and come back to him you know separately as well. Okay. No problem. Okay, um, if the contract allows for deduction for works as a result of the contractor not providing collateral warranties, how is this deduction made? Would this be via the pay less notice or could it be done in the QS valuation? Yeah, uh, good question. Um, it can be done in both, but again, again just to be safe, you, you are paying, you know, you are giving a notice that you're paying the, um, that you're paying the pay less money than that is applied for. So just be, just be safe and issue the pay less notice. That way then, that way you're covered. Okay. Yeah. Um, following practical completion, but during the rectification period, the client becomes aware of works that were not built in accordance with the contract. How would this be dealt with? Can the cost of rectification be deducted from the retention monies held by the client? What is the process I need to follow in order to do so, if it's possible? Okay, yeah, good question. Um, during the rectification period, work not in accordance with the contract. Well, I mean, like obviously, you know, that would that would really be dealt with, you know, in the final account. And and, I mean, arguably, he want, you know, you you shouldn't like a, a PC search shouldn't be issued unless everything is built in accordance with the contract. But, you know, obviously um, I'm aware that, you know, unfortunately these things do happen. I mean, really what, you know, do you want to go back to uh, the works that are not in accordance with the contract? Um, you know, these are going to be what we know as, def as defective works. And during the rectification period, uh, the contractor is required to, um, uh, to, to return to site and, and make good and, and basically, you know, build those works in accordance with the contract. Um, you know, moving on, can the cost of rectification be deducted? Yes. So, I mean, you know, you want to give the contractor notice that you know, of the works that are not in accordance with the contract. And then, you know, if it basically, if he doesn't return to site to make good, then you're going to have to use the retention monies um, in, order, in order to carry out the making good. Um, and what is the process? Yeah, the process there is that you you want to issue um, a schedule of defects is basically the key document, and it has to be issued um, before the expiry of the uh, of the rectification period. Very important because if you get if you don't issue the schedule of defects and the rectification period expires, then the retention becomes due, and you won't be entitled to uh, to to deduct. So. Look, as soon as you discover this, um, you want to be given your, your, you know, a schedule of defects ASAP, and uh, and deal with it that way. Okay. Okay. Um, 
If the application made does not provide an adequate breakdown of works, i.e. differentiation between contract works and variations, what detail does the breakdown of the payment stroke pay less notice need to incorporate? Yeah, um, good question. I mean, it's very, I mean, it's very rare. I mean, it's, it, it, it does happen. I, I mean, I guess, you know, what you're required to do is to, I mean, you can assess the, you know, the amounts based on, you know, on, on, on an analysis of each of the, you know, the costs that have been proposed to you. I mean, but, but if you are in a situation like this, I mean, I'd be, you know, I'd pick up the phone and say that, you know, the breakdown is inadequate. And, you know, sometimes you might be required to spell out, yeah, I, I guess, what you do require. And a lot of main contractors actually have, uh, they, they provide schedules now, which actually uh, show the, how, basically how applications for payment are to be made. Um, which is very, I mean, which is very helpful because obviously uh, that would, that does with any ambiguity, um, you know, from the very beginning. So, you know, and, and if you, and by including that, if a subcontractor doesn't give, you know, the application for payment in line with that, then you're, then, you know, you're going to say, you can, you can make an assessment, but you, you, you're going to say, you know, please refer back to the, um, you know, to schedule X of your, you know, of, of the contract in order to provide the adequate detail. Uh, so that's as much as you can do there. Okay. Um, are there any remedies for contractors who continually inflate their applications within the JCT standard form um, of contract and DMB contracts unamended, i.e. gives the client grounds for termination, etc.? Yeah. Um, so contractors continue to inflate their applications. Yeah. Um, Look at, I mean, I, I guess, you know, it happens quite, you know, quite frequently. It, often it depends on the, on the level of inflation. But, I mean, unfortunately, it doesn't give the, you know, I mean, it wouldn't be grounds for termination in itself. Certainly not under the standard forms. And, and, it's, it, and it doesn't really happen in schedules of amendments either. So, um, I mean, the remedy, like the remedies are, you know, if he's asking, you, you, you still have to deal with it. You still have to... Um, you know, to address his point, but I mean, there wouldn't be a remedy as such. You, you just have to keep dealing with it under, you know, what are only going to be pay less notices because, you know, you, you simply do not agree with the amounts that have been applied for. Mm. Um, and you should really deal with that then, you know, in, in valuation meetings to say, uh, you know, just like when this happened previously when I was in practice uh, or when I was a QS, I just say, you know, why are you why are you claiming, you know, why are you putting in such such high amounts? You know, the works aren't aren't in line in, you know, aren't complete to that to that to that level. So, you know, please, you know, just obviously make sure you're looking at the um, at the you know the, the progress on site before you're submitting any any applications for payment. That's as much as you can do. Okay. Yeah. Um can you confirm the definition of the due date and are due dates fixed in the contract if no payment schedule was agreed when entering into contract? Um, yeah, so the definition of the due date, like the due date means that the date when the, um, uh, when the, when the payment becomes due. I mean, like not, nothing too spectacular about that, but, um, you, know, as the scheme, you know, as the Construction Act says and, and as the scheme says is that if you haven't agreed a due date, then the due date will become uh, the day seven days after the application date. So the you know in that case uh, the scheme will will kick in to basically make good on uh, what what we would call an inadequate payment mechanism that's been agreed under the contract. So that's effectively what a due date is, and 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 how and how you could make it good in the event it wasn't clear in the contract. Okay. Okay. Um, someone else is asking here, so if you're paying less than the amount applied, should you call it a pay less notice in lieu of payment notice? Uh, yeah, if you were, uh, yeah, if you are paying less than the amount applied, you, you are, I mean, you're safer to call it a, a, a pay less notice, but I mean, you know, payment notice, this, this happens very frequently. Um, I, when I was in practice, I actually never, I can't remember issued a, issuing a payment notice. There was always pay less notices. And uh, if you want to just use one, you're, you're definitely safer to use pay less notice rather than pay less notice, okay? Okay. Yeah. Um, if the payee goes into default, is the payer obliged to make payment and issue payment notice? 
Uh, very good question. Uh, this is actually an area that's, it's actually being uh, reviewed, in, reviewed in the courts um, at the moment. Be, uh, but basically, it it like it does depend on on um, on what you know on the on what's been agreed in the contract because um you know if you have if if the um by default I, I presume it's an insolvency um and you know some some contracts don't say that insolvency is a term you know is a is a termination event um and you know but you know re realistically um what you would do, you know, what you would do is you'd issue a, you'd, you'd issue a, pay, um, a payment notice, uh, a, sorry, a pay less notice uh, in that in that event. Um, but a very, very common area uh, that, and most that main contractors do include a clause that, you know, if the subcontractor becomes in, insolvent, then, you know, the, the basically the main contractor is not under an obligation to make any further payments. So, you know, a typical kind of law, uh, lawyer answer, but uh, it, it does depend on, on uh, a lot of the time, it does depend on what the contract says. Okay. I can quite help being a typical sort of lawyer. Um, <laughs> in the instance, I'm contracting administrator on behalf of the client, Whose responsibility, responsibility is it to issue the payless notice, the CA or the client, on the basis that you believe a section of work has not been completed? Yeah, um, again, uh, you know, it, it does, it, this does again depend on, you know, who, you know, who is to provide the, um, you know, the payless notice under, under the contract. Um, so, you know, you, you can be a contract administrator, but I mean, usually, that, that, I mean, contract administrators, uh, not usually involved in that. I mean, I'd I'd say that, um, yeah. I mean, usually it's the quantity surveyor that's been employed by the, you know, by the client. So it just depends on what the makeup of the, you know, of the of the client's team is. And it's it's always good to establish that uh, from the outset. Um, and just moving on to the next point, the CA of the client on the basis you believe a section of the works has not been completed. Um, I mean, it depends, you know, so whoever is to issue the PLS notices under the contract, um, look, if a, if a section of the works hasn't been completed, then you simply won't be paying it and you'll, and you'll show that in your, in your, uh, in your calculation in, within the PLS notice itself, okay? Okay. Right, we seem to have come to the end of the questions, which is good. There are a fair few there tonight. So thank you, everyone, for your Very questions. Good. Thank you, Connor, for... Um, enlightening us on the, the topic of payments as far as the QS is concerned. Uh, we've got some more dates for you fixed in June uh, and July for more of these QS series. So we look forward to speaking to you then. Um, in the meantime, thank you everyone for attending and stay safe and we hope to see you all again soon. Thank you, Connor. Very good. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, Julie. No problem. <laughs>